Thanks for tuning in, guys. The Pets and Lawn Ginger, and this is What's Wrong with My Lawn? So I got a call from another person anxious to get their lawn looking good. Now, fall time is a great time to prepare the lawn for next season. Now, the overall goal of What's Wrong with My Lawn is to turn you guys from ordinary house people to pest and lawn ninjas. The whole point is to get you guys to diagnose problems off of my videos so you can learn these little flow charts that I'm doing to help your own lawns. All right, guys, on to step one. We know pattern is very important. Now, what we're checking for is if the pattern is an overall pattern over the entire lawn or if it's an isolated pattern. Now, this is going to tell us if we need to diagnose multiple different issues or if we're just looking at diagnosing one solid issue. Identifying color patterns is the next step of the process, which is a very important step. Here's your breakdown on the colors. When we're dealing with brown, it typically indicates lack of water. When we end up dealing with orange, it's typically some sort of burning from fertilizer. When we deal with brown, it's generally lack of water. Lime green is usually an indication of too much forced growth or we have some soil pollution. White colors are typically herbicide burn. Now it can range from white to yellow, which is important to understand. Now step number three is going to be our soil saturation test. Now it's important to understand that we want to have about six to eight inches of water at all times in the soil. Now what this does is it makes sure that our roots have water to chase. Now we also want to make sure that that water is not sitting on top and that the lower layers have a higher density of water than the upper layers. Now, water management is gonna be the most important part of this process. Watering less days and more minutes is really important. But that's why I like to have my AMS soil probe so I can see what's happening underneath the ground. Next stop in the process is the thatch rake. Now, it's really important to use the thatch rake in the diagnosing process because we want to see if there's any debris that's causing problems, letting micronutrients or macronutrients down to the soil so the roots have something to feed off of. Now, another important part of the process of the thatch rake is understanding why we want to remove the thatch. There's a couple of reasons. Not only do we want to allow these nutrients down, we want to remove dead, dying, or decaying debris if it gets to be too much because it invites turf insects. Turf insects do overwinter in this debris, but they also feed off of it as well, and it's kind of a welcome invitation for these bugs to go wild. Now, the next step in the process is very important. It's a pull test. We want to get our bear claws in the grass. We want to basically pull on the grass to see if the roots are intact or if the grass is intact. Now, if you pull on it and you get chunks like pizza slices coming out of the ground, we know that we've got some sort of turf insect like a grub that is actually eating the roots. So if it's bare dirt after you're all done, we need to move on to insecticides as part of the process. Now, if you pull on it, the roots are still intact, but the grass comes out in your hand, we're most likely dealing with a sod webworm, cutworm, or some sort of turf insect that is not going after the roots, but is going after the stems and stalks. Now, it's important to understand this because you're gonna have to use a different type of insecticide for a different type of turf insect. Now for the official walkthrough, as you can see guys, we've got this killer slope, a uh, little less than a 45 degree angle, and we have a lot of problems here. Um, the biggest thing that I'm noticing at this point is clover is a big issue. Um, we've got a lot of dandelions, and we've got about six different species of grass. Take a look here. We've got some um, right at the base here. We've got some bluegrass mixed with some rye grass. Um, I'm finding a lot of this fine rye and this uh, fine creeping fescue in here as well. Not uncommon considering we're on the mountainside. Um, we've got a ton of this bunching tall fescue coming through, but as you can see, the clover is just taking over. Um, expectations uh, and setting expectations is going to be a big deal on this lawn. Uh, not a lot that we can do about this bunching tall fescue. And as you can see, they've just got massive clumps coming through. So there's a couple of spots that we've got on the corner here. Um, and as you can see, 
we've uh, we've got some uh, Spurge and Black Medic traveling through the lawn as well. And uh, it looks like here we've got some common mallow and just a couple of hot spots that we're dealing with. Now, onto the backyard. I'm just gonna call this what it is because I don't think you guys can see it at home, but it looks like somebody had some heavy equipment, like maybe a truck or something that, that came through here and has caused some problems. We've, we've got some massive divots. Um, the, the problem that we face inside the divot is we get this uh, compact layer and as you can see, we're starting to form some moss here and that fungus is gonna prohibit new growth uh, a lot of times if it's not dealt with. Um, and we get this layer of uh, dead grass it just kind of chokes everything out on the surface and then it promotes more fungus. It's just kind of a cascading problem. Um, as we move back here, the, the one big thing is we have a ton of shade. You can see it's a fantastic backyard, uh, very well landscaped. Um, but then we also have a pool of water <laughs> just sitting here as well. So, um, Coming back here, we've got a couple of areas that are a little bit thin. And, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff that we're just going to have to deal with. But this is where it gets really funny. Um, we're going to have to dig in and do some diagnosing. Now, let's start off with the front yard, and then we'll deal with the backyard in just a little bit. It's really important to understand that sometimes we don't want to get too overwhelmed we want to start with things and then move on. So let's move on to the thatch rake and the pull test. Now, as far as water saturation, we got plenty of water in the soil, but I could tell that there's a history of uh, it being dry. Uh, the reason why I could tell that is because about six inches under, everything changes, things get more dense. Now, there is a little bit of gravel that I'm dealing with underneath that is slowing it down, uh, but you can tell by the soil, it's just not the same as the top layers. When the top layers are more wet than the bottom layers, you know you got a problem with water distribution. Let's go take a look at our results here, guys. Uh, I give the thatch test a, a C, <laughs> is what I give it. Um, they could definitely go another year or so without needing to power rake. Um, but when we get in here, all of a sudden, I remove all that, and now you can actually see the soil. We come an inch over, and it's just matted dead grass on top. So you can get in here, and you can kind of tug all this out and you can see it. Now, the problem that I have with this area is this ryegrass that he's got has been natively growing in here. It's starting to mat and die out on top of the soil that it's choking our Kentucky bluegrass out. So this is why it's important with your cool season grasses, you gotta figure out what grass you want. If you want the ryegrass, you're still gonna have to uh, remove that crown layer to get it to go because it's gonna live and die a couple times a year depending on the species of rye and it creates a crown layer too thick for other grasses to thrive, which is not a bad thing, it's just which dominant grass do you wanna have. Kentucky Blue has the tightest rhizomes, which just means that uh, it's got those creeping stalks that come out, but this is typical with rye, these giant spaces. Um, your bluegrass is not going to have massive areas like this. Now, some species of rye that is not rhizomatous, it's important to understand that the grass type you have, this may only shoot one stalk in this area. This might be the grass that you get, where your bluegrass here is going to shoot multiple stalks up and over as long as those rhizomes can come up out of the ground. So let's talk about our weed control in conjunction with the thatch layers. Now we know it's about a C, uh, it's definitely time to do the power rake in the majority of this lawn, but a lot of this lawn is thin because of lack of water. Now the lack of water and the density of and population of the weeds go hand in hand. We need a lawn that's thick. You wanna get rid of the weeds 
we need to thicken up the lawn. Now there's a couple of things here that we want to look at. The lack of potassium and the lack of phosphorus are going to be our number one issues with rhizomatous density in our cool season rhizomatous grasses. So we want to make sure that if you guys have a history of weeds, you need to boost the phosphorus early spring and the potassium late spring to make sure that you can create that density. Now it's important to go back to the ABCs, one, two, threes of my long diagnosis here. We've got a pattern here, it's an isolated issue. Uh, you can see it's got kind of a checkered pattern in here, but you'll see nice rounded beveled edges. Those beveled edges are usually an indication of sprinkler coverage issues. Now, the one thing I did to prove that this is a sprinkler coverage issue, we're not just throwing darts, uh, is we did the soil probe test. The soil probe came back. I was only getting about a two inch core and with all this rain, I would expect an eight to 10 inch core. So we can confirm that this area right here is definitely lack of water and a history of lack of water. Next up is checking for turf insects. Uh, we want to take a bear claw and just kind of pull on the grass. Now you can see here, the grass is really intact. It's not just pulling up like a pizza slice and I'm not getting anything in my hand. Now, for those of you who want to know what the wrong way of doing is that I get customers, oh, I got plenty of dead grass, are you kidding me? They go like this and they pull this out. Well, this is your bad mulch and they've just torn the grass out. The point of this exercise isn't to do that, it's to really get in here and pull on it. As far as I can see throughout the entire lawn, we have no insect issue. All right, we'll make this one snappy because it's pretty clear. Uh, too much water in the soil. I, I'm pulling plugs that are eight to 14 inches long and then six inches away, I'm pulling plugs that are six to eight inches long. Plenty of water back here, but the biggest problem is sprinkler coverage is way off. I shouldn't be getting a 14 to 16 inch plug and then a six to eight inch plug just right next to each other. So we really just need to hire a sprinkler specialist to come in here. Understand that history is a big part in any uh, lawn diagnosing. Now, most of you at home, you're already gonna know your history, but in this instance, I had to make a phone call to figure out what was going on. Uh, it turns out recently, they recently had a contractor who brought a bobcat back here and that's what's caused a lot of the compaction issues and that's what's caused a lot of the thinning, thinning out. The other issues that we have are all these beautiful trees back here. We need to get an arborist here to thin it out. Kentucky bluegrass has to have a minimum of four hours of sunlight a day to thrive. And I'm guessing it's probably getting about two and a half to three um, because we have the edge of the house on the other side here. Hopefully I'm not making too many of you dizzy. Um, but as the sun comes up and over, it hits the trees and then on the back side, it hits the house. So in my opinion, we really need to push a different grass other than um, Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass is not gonna thrive very well in these conditions. We wanna look at our uh, turf type tall fescues and look into rhizomatous rye grasses. This is where it gets fun. It looks like after they laid the concrete, they tried to re -sod. I'm not sure who was in charge of this. Um, this is where our pull tests come in charge. I found out they did this about a month ago, so I don't expect it to be perfect. But I mean, look at this. This is my finger and this is the sod. It's almost an inch off of the ground. They really didn't need this in very, very well. It almost looks like they laid it just on top of the grass, which is really, really weird. Uh, you usually want to box these in and cut them in so you get some good uh, root density, um, but it's just not taking. And I, I, this is crazy, right? So we're a month in and it, this is not super abnormal, but oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Let me give you a close up here. This is wet grass. The, <laughs> well, that's something. Um, so I've seen that. <laughs> Guys, you can't even stop right now. I've seen this a couple of times. Um, it, it appears that the contractor or whoever did this was lazy. Uh, <laughs> instead of leveling out the ground, they put the sod right on top of the, the grass that was previously there. Um, I found two spots already exactly the same and the roots aren't taken, they're not going to take. This is where it got pretty obvious to me what is going on. You can see the grass here and then all of a sudden, this is a chunk of sod and look it. I mean, yeah, we've got some roots, but look, that's grass <laughs> underneath there. 
Uh, usually when I say I've seen it all, there, there's something else that comes to surprise me. Uh, but guys, don't do this at home. This is not a good way to level. We've talked about how if we mulch them properly, we get the grass strands too long, it forms a weed barrier. Um, basically what they've done is they've formed themselves a weed barrier. So as you can see where the grass was thin due to the, uh, due to the lack of sunlight, it's taking because chances are those areas were already bald. Uh, you've got a 50-50 shot on if something like this is gonna take. The only way to fix this is to, uh, to scrape the top again or just hope and pray you get enough decomposition and enough uh, insect activity to decompose all that grass underneath to the point where the roots can find the dirt underneath too. Now my diagnosis is pretty simple. Uh, we know that the primary causation here has been inconsistent watering and I dare say inconsistent mowing. Now we've got a secondary issue where they decided to re-landscape that's also caused some problems. Now, if this were my choice, what I would choose first is I would choose to attack the density issue because that's also gonna attack the problems with the weeds. Now a solid fertilizer uh, plan and a solid watering plan are gonna be our one-two punch in this issue. But it's late fall. We don't wanna push for forced growth. We want to focus on root development. So our micronutrients are gonna be a, play a big part in this, but so is phosphorus. Potassium is gonna be a close second, but it's not as important as our phosphorus contents and the micronutrients. All right, let's talk about the weed problem and the density issue in the front yard. The easiest way to fix that is to go rent yourself a slit slice seeder. I'm not a big fan of those, but it's the easy way to put the seed into the soil where it needs to be. Now, if you wanna cheat the system, go rent an aerator, aerate this thing two to three times over in a checker pattern throw your seed down. I would choose a probably a rhizomatous tall fescue in the front yard and a rhizomatous rye blend with fescue in the backyard. Now, as for the clover issues this time of the year, you've got a couple different choices. If you're not gonna do the overseed, you can use an ester 24 d It's a really simple way of fixing it. Now, if you want to hit it with the overseed, they do sell tenacity. I'll post the link in the description where you can hit it with the tenacity at the same time that you overseed. It, Clover is listed on the label. Now at the end of the day, it's easy to understand why a solid watering plan and a solid lawn fertilization plan is important. Another important thing to understand is this lawn is 20 to 30 years old at a minimum. Introducing new grass seed is a healthy way of thickening things up. Now, I'd love to help you guys out at home. If you guys have any questions or concerns, hit me up in the comments. I'd love to hear the progress on your own lawns. Really appreciate the support you've given me. In the meantime, guys, this is the Lawn Ginger. What's wrong with my lawn? See ya.